Hi there, welcome to POC Nurse. My name is Gozi, and today we're going to talk about heart failure for the CCRN exam. Now, heart failure is a rather big topic, so we're going to focus on the things that we need to know for the exam. Okay, so there are different kinds of heart failure. Um, there could be acute heart failure, chronic heart failure, acute exacerbation of chronic heart failure, diastolic heart failure, systolic heart failure. Heart failure could also be left-sided or right-sided. So usually um, heart failure can lead to cardiogenic shock, which is like the culmination of everything heart failure, meaning nothing is working, the body has tried to compensate, it's not able to, now we have shock, where the heart is unable to pump blood to the body at all. So cardiogenic shock will be like at the pinnacle of the effects of heart failure. Okay, so what is heart failure? Heart failure is a condition where the heart is unable to pump blood out, out to the body, meaning there's decreased cardiac output. It's also a condition where you have a lot of volume sitting in the heart, a lot of blood sitting in the heart, Why? Right? Because the heart is unable to pump out that blood. So you have increased pressures in the heart. So when we talk about heart failure, we think about increased pressure in the heart due to volume sitting in the heart, due to blood sitting in the heart. We also think about decreased cardiac output because the heart is unable to pump or eject the blood out of the left ventricle and into the body. Another form of heart failure is acute decompensated heart failure. So the word acute already tells us that the symptoms are sudden, they come on suddenly. So in acute decompensated heart failure, there's a, a sudden onset of symptoms that are severe enough that the patient has to stay in the hospital. So usually um, patients that are admitted for acute decompensated heart failure usually have a history of chronic heart failure. So like approximately 75% of our patients with acute decompensated heart failure have a history of chronic heart failure. Now, we spoke about uh, systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure earlier. So heart failure with systolic dysfunction is where the patient's ejection fraction is less than 40%. So this patient has an ejection problem. That is the patient has trouble or the patient's heart has trouble pumping blood out of the heart and into the, into the body. When we talk about um, diastolic heart failure, we're talking about heart failure with diastolic dysfunction. So in this case, the heart has trouble filling. So during diastole, the heart is, the ventricles are filling with blood. So in diastolic dysfunction, when you talk about heart failure, the heart has a problem filling with blood. It has a filling problem, but ejection fraction is usually greater than 50%. So the heart is okay with pumping blood out of it. Uh, ventricles. Now we're going to talk about something called BNP. It's a it's a protein peptide. It's called B-type natriuretic peptide, and it's usually released by the ventricles. So the ventricle will release this peptide when the walls of when its walls are under pressure, meaning it's filling with with blood with volume. So then the, the walls of the ventricles have to stretch to accumulate this bigger volume that they have to hold. So as the, the walls of the ventricle stretch, it releases this uh, BNP peptide. And the more pressure there is on the walls of the ventricles, the higher the levels of this BNP peptide will be. So usually when the heart failure patients come in through the ER, you know, complaining of shortness of breath and whatnot, the doctors will usually order a chemistry with BNP included. So, like I said, BNP um, is usually high in the heart failure patients because their, their hearts are having to hold um, more volume of blood than usual because due to the heart failure, especially if they have um, systolic heart failure, the heart is unable to eject this blood fully out of itself and into the body.
Now we're going to talk about the um, pathophysiology of acute decompensated heart failure um, regarding systolic dysfunction. So acute decompens decompensated um, systolic heart failure. So remember when we talked about systolic heart failure, we said it's an ejection problem. So the heart is unable to pump out blood efficiently and effectively. So, and this is an acute problem. So it's coming on suddenly. So the cause would have to be some, something sudden as well. So the pathophysiology of this starts usually with a precipitating activity. So the patient might have some kind of um, uh, arrhythmia, like an acute arrhythmia. Patient might have some kind of valvular dysfunction. Um, there might be cardiomyopathy in play or coronary artery disease. Patient might have had an MI, something that just disrupts the normal functioning of the ventricles. So when in any of these precipitating um, causes come on, the, the ventricles are unable to eject properly. So mostly the left ventricle is where the issue arises because that's how the body gets perfused from the left ventricle. So when the left ventricle is unable to eject blood effectively, there's less perfusion to the organs and we start having um, symptoms of heart failure. So in this case, ejection fraction is going to go down. It's going to be less than 40%, like we st spoke about before in uh, systolic heart failure. Ejection fraction is less than 40%. So when if ejection fraction is low, you have blood sitting in the left ventricle and more blood is coming in. So what's going to happen? That blood is going to back up into the lungs, back to the right ventricle and, and so on and so forth. So if the blood backs up into the lungs, now you have pulmonary edema, you have hypoxemia, the patient is unable to, uh, the patient's lungs, will be unable to perform gas exchange um, efficiently. So that's where the hypoxemia comes in. When this happens now, the body has to do something to compensate. So you don't have enough blood circulating in the system. You have uh, little oxygen. So the body will now release um, catecholamine. So the sympathetic system is activated. You have epinephrine floating in the body. Um, increase systemic vascular resistance. The vessels are constricting to increase pressure and move blood along. Now, the, if the ejection fraction continues to fall, cardiac output will fall. So meaning there will be, meaning the, the left ventricle is not pumping out enough blood, meaning the body is not getting perfused, blood pressure starts to drop. So this is how we have systolic dysfunction occurring in the body. There's usually a precipitating um, cause. It could be um, due to coronary artery disease. So you have like ischemia occurring. It could be due to an arrhythmia, something like AFib. It could also be due to maybe the patient has an infection, maybe the patient is septic. Um, drug use as well is another one, you know, patients coming after taking cocaine, talking about, oh, they have chest pain, they have chest pain. So a patient with heart failure doing this will exacerbate their symptoms. Um, and patients that don't take their medication, if they're not very compliant, non-compliant, it could also precipitate an acute episode of, um, decompensated systolic uh, heart failure. Now, when a, a patient has systolic heart failure for a long time and it gets chronic, the, the body releases um, compensatory hormones and the heart, the heart gets remodeled. It's, it's not the same as it used to be. And because of the release of these hormones, one way to treat the patient is to give the patient medications that will reduce the effects of these hormones. Now, when we talk about release of hormones, we're basically talking about the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, 
hormone cascade in the body. So when the heart is not releasing um, enough blood to the body, the kidney detects it. The kidney detects it, and what does the kidney do? The kidney releases renin. It's an enzyme. Renin acts on um, the protein angiotensin, right? It breaks angiotensin down to angiotensin 1. And then we have another enzyme called the angiotensin converting enzyme. It converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a heavyweight vasoconstrictor, right? It constricts those vessels and increases blood flow back to the heart. So it's going to increase volume in the heart. And already the heart cannot handle the volume that it has going on. And the kidney is making sure more volume goes back to the heart because the kidney is not getting enough blood, is not getting perfused well enough, right? So now we have this angiotensin 2 that's causing vasoconstriction. Also, during this cascade, we have aldosterone released from the altering adrenal glands. What does this do? Fluid retention. It, it makes the body keep more fluid, which means more fluid going back to the heart, more blood going back to the heart. Already the heart cannot handle the, the amount of volume it has, and this aldosterone is making it have more volume. Angiotensin 2 also stimulates the sympathetic um, pathway. So then you have epinephrine, epinephrine floating in the system for the causing um, vasoconstriction. And so this is like the whole cascade that occurs with um, the compensatory mechanism for heart failure. But this is also where treatment is targeted. Right, so that's how we have our ACE inhibitors, the uh, ARBs, the diuretic agents. So let me start with the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. So because um, I, earlier I called the initial protein angiotensin, it's angiotensinogen uh, in the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. So the the first thing that happens is that. Renin is released. Renin causes angiotensinogen to be converted to angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensin 1 doesn't do anything yet. It's when angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 that we have the powerful vasoconstrictor that also stimulates other activities to compensate for this heart failure, right? So angiotensin 2 happens because of the angiotensin converting enzyme. So our ACE inhibitors are the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So they prevent the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So then once we prevent angiotensin 2 from happening, from being created, then we reduce the likelihood of the vasoconstriction, sympathetic response, and aldosterone secretion, so fluid retention. Another area that treatment uh, targets is also um, the angiotensin receptor sites. So also we're trying to prevent the production of angiotensin 2 with the ARB medication. So the, the ARB medication, I think I said it already, is angiotensin receptor blockers, right? So this will prevent the also production of angiotensin 2, which is that powerful vasoconstrictor that also stimulates um, sympathetic res response and the release of aldosterone. So those two medications, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, prevent the formation of angiotensin 2. Example of an ACE inhibitor is uh, are the prill medication lisinopril. An example of the ARB um, medication is like a valsartan. They usually end in sartan, lusartan. And then 
we talk about um, aldosterone. How can we mitigate the effects of aldosterone? Now, aldosterone makes the body retain more fluid, more water. So to negate the effects, we give diuretics. It helps the patient lose more water. So that's the, the water pill, the patients say, makes them pee a lot, so they lose more fluid that way. And then we talk about the sympathetic response that angiotensin II causes. So the way to combat that is by giving the patient um, beta blockers. It'll reduce the effects of, um, I keep saying epinephrine, of norepinephrine, which is later converted to epinephrine. So, but anyway, um, we give beta blockers to, to negate the effects of um, the catecholamines that's released due to angiotensin II stimulation. Now we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of diastolic heart failure. So we said before that diastolic heart failure is just when the heart has a filling problem. And when will the heart have a filling problem? If it's not stretching to accommodate volume, if it's too big, if there's not enough space in the heart to accommodate volume. So maybe the, the muscles of the heart have thickened and gotten bigger. So now you have less space inside of the heart. Maybe the heart is not as stretchy as it's supposed to be due to something, maybe infection. Now the heart is kind of restricted in, in movement, in, in motion. It, it doesn't, it's not um, elastic. So some things that can cause this, chronic hypertension, valvular disease, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We spoke about these already. So in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the muscles are thickened. It's also called restrictive cardiomyopathy. The muscles are thickened. Um, in valvular disease, um, we have the heart is keeping more fluid and working harder to pump it out. So this can cause the muscles to get thicker. Same thing with hypertension. The heart is working really hard to pump against these high pressures. The muscles can get thicker. So meaning less space inside of the heart to fill with blood. And we know the blood keeps coming into the heart. So now if there's not enough space for the heart to hold the blood, it has to go back somewhere. So it's going to go back into the lungs and we're going to have pulmonary edema, hypoxemia. And in this case, we need to remember that ejection fraction is fine. The heart can pump well, it just isn't feeling well. Now we're gonna do a contrast, like a compare and contrast between diastolic and systolic um, heart failure. So in, and we talked about some of this already, in systolic heart failure, the primary problem is with ejection. The heart is unable to get re get blood out of the, the, the ventricle. On the other hand, in diastolic, the in diastolic heart failure, the primary problem is that the heart is unable to fill with volume properly because either there is no space or there is no elasticity for the heart to stretch and accommodate the volume. Now, when we talk about signs and symptoms, for diastolic heart failure, when you do an x-ray, the heart will usually be a normal size. On the other hand, when we do uh, an x-ray for the patient with systolic heart failure, you have a, a, a bigger heart size, usually. But also, the, the heart might be normal size, but if it's, I feel like if it's gone on long enough and the heart has held larger volumes than it should over a long period of time, it might get bigger and it might show up on x-ray. So, the, you know, the point of maximal impulse when you're checking for, when you're checking for the, the space where you can feel the the impulse of the heart the best it's usually at the fifth intercostal space uh, space mid clavicular line 
So in a patient that has systolic heart failure and, you know, blood has been sitting in the heart for a while and the heart has gotten bigger, that point will shift. It will shift to the left because the heart has gotten bigger. So that point is no longer where it is usually. Another uh, sign of systolic heart failure is valvular insufficiency. Again, um, ejection fraction is less than 40% or about 40% in systolic heart failure. And because systolic heart failure happens, it affects the left ventricle most of the time, you have blood backing up into the lungs and we have a situation where the patient has pulmonary edema because the ventricle is not emptying properly. Patient may have S3 heart sound, extra heart sound, and blood pressure is usually normal or low. And of course, BNP is elevated. BNP, that protein that the heart releases when it's holding too much blood, is going to be an indicator of systolic heart failure. Continuing with diastolic heart failure, we talked about it being a problem with space and elasticity. So some of the signs are, oh, the, we talked about the patient will have most likely a normal uh, size heart, normal ventricle size, but the inside of the ventricles may be thick. The septum may be thick, therefore taking up space and reducing space for the heart to hold blood. The, the patient's heart will have normal contractile function because those muscles have thickened, you know, they are jacked and they will pump effectively, but there's not much for the, the muscles to, of the heart to pump. Um, EF, the ejection fraction will be normal. But again, this patient will also have pulmonary edema because if the heart cannot hold the blood like we talked about before, it has to go somewhere. It has to flow forward or flow backward. If it's unable to flow forward, it's going to flow backwards to the lungs. And then we have a situation of pulmonary edema. Again, in diastolic heart failure, the patient has an S4 heart sound with hypertension. Um, so therefore the blood pressure is usually high and uh, BNP is also elevated. Um, treatment for both systolic and diastolic heart um, failure are pretty much similar um, because the same thing will happen in both. There will be decreased perfusion, the kidneys will sense it, release renin, and the angiotensinogen pathway will commence. So beta blockers, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, diuretics, aldosterone antagonists, and um, positive inotropes as well as calcium channel blockers are used to treat heart failure. More specifically, or rather, let, let's do it this way. So in both systolic and diastolic heart failure, patients get beta blockers, patients get ACE inhibitors and patient get ARBs. The patients also get diuretics as well as aldosterone antagonists. Now, more on the systolic side, we talked about it being an ejection problem. Patients can get positive inotropes medications to help the heart pump. The patients can also get um, medications that dilate the, the blood vessels. So, this is what we talk about our nitrates and our, excuse me, hydralazine. So that's for systolic heart failure. This subject is big. I'm trying to be careful so that I give you the right information. And then in the case of diastolic heart failure, the patient can get calcium channel blockers to relax the, the muscles. Now, things that are contraindicated in systolic and diastolic heart failure. Let's talk about systolic heart failure. In systolic heart failure, we don't give any negative inotropes. Remember, the problem here is that we have an ejection problem. The heart is not pumping well, is not pumping properly. So any negative inotrope will exacerbate the problem. We don't want to relax the heart. We want the heart to work, to pump. 
and to eject blood out of itself. Another um, contraindication in systolic heart failure, in this case, when we are in an acute decompensated heart failure position, we don't give the beta blockers because what do the beta blockers do? It's a, it's a negative inotrope. So it relaxes the heart, reduces heart rate. So if the patient is in an acute phase where they're not ejecting, we hold the beta blockers and hopefully we start later when the patient is better. In the case of diastolic heart failure, things that are contraindicated are positive inotropes, and anything that will cause the patient to get very dehydrated and tachycardic because when the patient is tachycardic the heart doesn't have enough time to fill with blood and we already have a filling problem and the patient gets so dehydrated that the heart doesn't have enough volume to pump out that won't be good as well now um, let's talk about the types of cardiomyopathies we see in systolic and diastolic heart failure I think it's pretty intuitive. So when we talk about systolic heart failure, we're talking about um, anything that causes the heart muscle to not work properly. So in this case, we're going to have dilated cardiomyopathy, meaning the, the, the heart is getting thinner. So if the muscles get thinner, they're less effective, they're not as strong. So then the heart is not going to pump effectively, which is where we have this ejection problem associated with systolic heart failure. Something else to consider is that as the, as the heart dilates, as it, it increases in size, the, the valves, the mitral valves, are also going to get stretched meaning they're not going to be as competent as they are usually, meaning they're not going to be tight, tightly closed. So valvular in insufficiency can happen here. In the case of diastolic heart failure, the types of cardiomyopathy that can happen here are hypertrophic and restrictive cardiomyopathy. In hypertrophic, we're talking about thickened muscles, and in restrictive, we're talking about anything that makes the heart as a whole less elastic. And we've said this um, before. There's a lot of repetition here. I hope it's okay with you. Uh, maybe to help remember these facts um, a little better. Moving on. We're going to talk about chest, chest X-ray results um, regarding systolic and diastolic heart failure. So we talked about this a little bit before. Again, some more repetition. Um, so in systolic heart failure, we know there is a possibility of a dilated heart. When the heart gets dilated, it gets bigger. So on x-ray, a patient with systolic heart failure might be found to have a larger size heart than normal, and the heart could also be a normal size. Remember, we also spoke about uh, a shift in the point of maximal impulse, which is where you feel the impulse of the heart the most is at the fifth in intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. And for the patient with um, systolic heart failure, uh, there's usually a, a shift in the PMI point of maximal impulse to the left, so away from where it is usually. Now, in diastolic heart failure, when you do an X-ray, the heart is usually a normal size. But if you do an EKG, you will see, um, uh, it will be an abnormal EKG and it will show, um, it could show a left ventricular hypertrophy pattern. Usually when the doctors look at it, I think there's some kind of amplified um, reading and there will be like immediately this patient has uncontrolled hypertension. And so you might not see it on the chest x-ray, but you could see it on the EKG. That's talking about diastolic heart failure. When we first started this um, review, we talked about the different kinds of heart failure. 
We talked about systolic, diastolic, left-sided, right-sided. So now we're going to talk about left-sided v. right-sided heart failure. Let's start with left-sided heart failure, things that can cause left-sided heart failure. Um, usually the left ventricle is affected. Um, coronary artery disease, this is where we have ischemia. Um, MI, which also is associated with ischemia. Cardiomyopathies, we talked about this before. Fluid overload, chronic uncontrolled hypertension. Aortic stenosis, because the left ventricle has to work really hard to get blood through a very narrow aortic valve, uh, mitral stenosis, and cardiac tamponade. So these are all things that can cause left-sided heart failure. These are things that can cause the left ventricle not to work as well as it should. Moving on to right-sided heart failure. Usually things that affect the lungs will affect the right side. Anything that increases pressure in the lungs affects the right side of the heart, so the right ventricle. All right. Acute right ventricular infarct will cause right-sided heart failure. Massive PE, massive pulmonary embolism will cause right-sided heart failure. Septal defects. So if you have um, an opening between the left and right ventricles, you're going to have more blood flowing into the right ventricle. And even though it's built for volume, it can only take so much volume before it starts to fail as well. Pulmonary stenosis, COPD, pulmonary hypertension, and left ventricular failure can cause right-sided heart failure. So if the left ventricular heart failure goes on for long enough, you have blood backing up in the right ventricle, and it can only handle so much volume, as we said before. At some point, it's going to fail, and that blood is going to start backing up into the body. So this is causes of right-sided and left-sided heart failure. Now we're going to talk about the signs and symptoms of left-sided and right-sided heart failure. Usually, um, sometimes when I study, there's usually a picture uh, like of two bodies. And when you look at the right-sided heart failure, you see that the legs are big. When you look at the left-sided heart failure, the legs are normal. They usually emphasize the legs. So this is when um, in right-sided heart failure, blood backs up into the body. In, in left-sided heart failure, blood backs up into the lungs. So keeping that in mind, let's talk about the signs and symptoms of left-sided heart failure. So in left-sided heart failure, remember, we said the blood is going to back up into the lungs. So this patient will have breathing problems. So the patient is going to have trouble breathing depending on, the, on their position. If they lay down flat, it's going to be hard to breathe. If they sit up, it will be better. This patient will also have shortness of breath, dyspnea, and tachypnea, breathing fast. Patient is going to have hypoxemia. It's going to be hard to exchange gas in a lung that's filled with fluid. Tachycardia. Crackles in the lungs because you have fluid sitting there in the alveoli. And when the patient coughs, it will be with a uh, pink frothy sputum. One time I think I had a patient that was intubated, a heart failure patient. And, you know, we're looking at the, um, the ET tube and he had pink frothy sputum in it. And, you know, the, the other nurse that was with me was like, oh, this patient has a heart failure. Look at that, it's, uh, the sputum is pink and it's frothy, so smart. The patient will also have um, elevated uh, pulmonary, um, pretty much the pressures in the lungs will be elevated because fluid is backing up in there. Um, when you do like the pulmonary artery uh, wedge pressure, it will be high. Patient will be diaphoretic, patients will be anxious and confused. Now this is left-sided heart failure. I want to talk about right hearted side failure. Patient is going to have hepatomegaly. Remember, we talked about right heart, right-sided heart failure being associated with fluid backing up into the body. So it's going to back up from the right side of the lung, back to the liver, back to the abdomen, back to the lower extremities. So you're going to have hepatomegaly enlarged liver, splenomegaly, enlarged spleen, dependent edema, remember that picture with the person with the big legs and the person with the normal size leg. So 
this is where dependent edema comes in. The patient has fluid just sitting in their in their legs. Venous distension, elevated um, CVP. Um, the patient will have jugular. Uh, the jugular vein will be distended. When you ask the patient to turn their face to one side, you see that the, the jugular vein is distended because there's so much blood pumping through there. Um, the patient may also have tricuspid insufficiency and abdominal pain because of all the fluid sitting in the abdomen and probably stretching it out. The patient is going to complain of pain in their abdomen. Now, so these are the symptoms of left-sided and right-sided heart failure. So pretty much left-sided has a lot um to do with like pulmonary symptoms the, the lungs the coughing up the pink for the sputum trouble breathing shortness of breath and in the right sided we have all symptoms of fluid accumulation down in the legs in the liver and the spleen moving on we're going to talk about um classifications of heart failure the two types of classification are the American Heart Association stages of heart failure. Uh, this is classified according to heart failure progression and the New York Heart Association for functional classes. So this one is based on the patient's um, symptoms. Another difference between the American Heart Association and New York Heart Association um, classification is that the American Heart Association talks about stages of heart failure and recommended treatment for each stage. The New York Heart Association just fo focuses on the four functional classes. It doesn't talk about treatment. So when we talk about um, heart failure, the main cause of death from heart failure is when the patient develops um, uh, a sudden death arrhythmia. So when we focus on the New York Heart Association classification, there are four. So in class two to four, patients are maybe candidates for an AICD, an implanted cardioverter defibrillator, because of this sudden death arrhythmia. Now we're going to talk about the American Heart Association stages of heart failure. Stage A is high risk and with no evidence of dysfunction. Stage B is heart disorder or structural defect, no symptoms. Stage C is heart disorder or structural defect with symptoms. Stage D is end stage cardiac disease with symptoms despite maximal therapy. All right, so that's the American Heart Association stages of heart association. Now we're going to talk about the New York Heart Association heart failure classes. Remember we said there was four, it's class one through four. And it basically talks about activity and symptoms. When the patient does this, this happens. When the patient doesn't do anything, this is what happens. So in class one, when the patient does their regular activities, they have no symptoms. But if they do extraordinary activities, they will have heart failure symptoms. So I don't know if you know about this guy, David Goggins. Um, I read his book a couple of weeks ago, but I've been hearing about him on the internet. So he was a Navy SEAL and an athlete. And, you know, he did all this extraordinary stuff, running these long marathons. But at one point, he couldn't do all this remarkable sport things he was doing because he kept getting tachycardic. So, you know, athletes usually have a low pulse. He said his resting pulse was usually 30 beats per minute, but he started getting up there to 80 and over 100. When he, and this is when he's trying to do. So now his regular activities are not regular for us because he goes running, he goes cycling. So when he tries to do these things that he usually does, he, he, gets, um, he started getting um, tachycardic and tachypnic, short of breath. And when he went to the hospital, he, he was found out that he had an atrial septal defect. So that's what was causing his symptoms. So in class one of the New York Heart Association um, heart failure classes, 
ordinary activities will not cause any symptoms, but when the patient starts to do extraordinary things, like this Mr. Goggins guy, they start to get symptoms. Now, in class two, the patient is comfortable at rest. But when the patient does ordinary activities, like get up to go take a walk, they start having heart failure symptoms. Now, in class three, the patient is also comfortable at rest, but minimal activities will cause the patient to have heart failure symptoms. Class four of the New York Heart Association Heart Failure class, the patient has symptoms of heart failure at rest, and the patient is severely limited in what they can do activity-wise. So when I took the exam, I, I think I had one question on this, and it, it straight up just asked, I believe, which was which. And I don't know if I got that question right, but you want to memorize these classes in case you have one question from there, so you have it in the bag. You want to record, uh, you want to memorize the American Heart Association classification and the New York Heart Association classifications. Um, you do. So I'm going to go over it one more time. So for the American Heart Association stages of heart failure in stage A and for the American Heart Association, it's letters stage A through D. Stage A patient is high risk with no evidence of dysfunction. In stage B, the patient has a heart disorder or structural defects, no symptoms. In stage C, the patient has a heart disorder or structural defect with symptoms. And in stage D, stage D is usually like terminal for both. In stage D, patient has end stage cardiac disease with symptoms despite maximal therapy. You've given everything um, and patient still has symptoms. So that's the AHA, American Heart Association Stages of Heart Failure. Now the New York Heart Association Heart Failure classes are numbered Roman numbers, one through four. Class one, ordinary activity doesn't do anything. Patient is fine, patient can go for their usual walks if that's what they usually do. Now the, patient, the day the patient decides to run a marathon like this Goggins guy, the patient will have symptoms. So class one, ordinary activity does not cause symptoms. Extraordinary activities will cause heart failure symptoms. In class two, the patient is comfortable at rest, but when the patient does ordinary activity, the patient will have heart failure symptoms. In class three, the patient is comfortable at rest, but with minimal activity, the patient will have heart failure symptoms. And finally, in class four, the patient has heart failure symptoms at rest and the patient is very limited in what they can do activity wise that's it with the classifications of both the american heart association and the new york heart association classification of heart failure try and memorize it we're coming to the end of this chapter on heart failure for the ccrn exam now we're going to talk about cardiomyopathy we spoke about it before remember there's a lot of repetition in this chapter. So we're going to talk about the differences between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy. Now in dilated cardiomyopathy is similar to systolic dysfunction because when the heart is dilated, it doesn't pump well. You know, it's thinned out, the muscles are not as strong as before, so ejection will be a problem. Now, classic signs of uh, dilated Cardiomyopathy is a thinning uh, and dilation and, of course, uh, enlargement of the left ventricle of the heart. Also, because the heart, the, the ventricles dilate, it's going to pull the, the valves apart somewhat. So we're going to have um, insufficiency in the valve. So when we talk about systolic dysfunction, or um, dilated cardiomyopathy, they're kind of interchangeable because they present, they cause similar things. So when the heart is dilated, the muscles are thin, they're not as strong as usual, so it's not going to eject as well as usual. So because of the dilation of the ventricles and the valves pulling apart, we have valvular insufficiency. 
So left ventricular dilation will cause mitral valve insufficiency. Now, um, we already spoke about the fact that systolic um, heart failure and dilated uh, cardiomyopathy are similar, so the symptoms are similar. Now for the treatment, treatment of dilated uh, cardiomyopathy is similar to that of systolic heart failure. You want to help the heart pump better. Um, patients like these may benefit from a, a ventricular assist device or a heart transplant. Moving on to hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy, this is similar to diastolic dysfunction because in um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the, the walls of the heart of the ventricles are thick, so there's no space for it to store blood, which means we have a filling problem as opposed to an ejection problem when we talked about systolic heart failure or dilated cardiomyopathy. So in the case of uh, diastolic heart failure, which is, uh, which is similar to hypertro hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, when you talk about the symptoms and how it affects the heart, there's increased thickening of the heart muscle and the septum. So this will cause reduced space in, in the chamber, in the left ventricle. And symptoms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, are similar to that of diastolic heart failure. Um, the patient will be tired, patient will have trouble breathing, chest pain, patient will have um, S3 and S4 heart sounds, palpitations, and patient might feel faint or actually faint. So these are the symptoms of diastolic heart failure and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Treatment is similar to treatment for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is similar to that of uh, diastolic heart failure. So we want to do everything we can for the heart to fill with blood. Um, in the case of hypertrophic or diastolic dysfunction, there's an increased risk that a patient might have sudden cardiac death. So this is where we stop for heart failure for the CCRN exam. I hope you find, found this helpful. Please like, subscribe, and share with your friends, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye now.